shall move to questions without notice. Are there questions without notice? I give the call to the Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Before the election, the now Prime Minister promised to cut electricity bills by $275, provide cheaper mortgages and to ensure families will be better off on the cost of living. Instead of reducing costs for working families, he's delivered 12 mortgage rate increases, a 22 per cent increase in electricity prices, and food and groceries have jumped by over 11 per cent. Why does this tricky Prime Minister repeatedly promise one thing and do another? Order. There was far too much noise on my right. The Minister for Infrastructure and the Treasurer were continually interjecting during that question. The Leader of the Opposition will ask his question again. I could not hear what he was saying. So no more inter interjections during questions. The Leader of the Opposition has the call. With great pleasure. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Prime Minister, before the election, you promised to cut electricity bills by $275, provide cheaper mortgages and to ensure, and I quote, families will be better off on the cost of living. Instead of reducing costs for working families, he's delivered 12 mortgage rate increases, a 22 per cent surge in electricity prices, and food and groceries have jumped by over 11 per cent. Why does this tricky Prime Minister repeatedly promise one thing and do another? Call to the Prime Minister. Thanks, Mr Speaker. Well, I, I thank the... Uh Leader of the Opposition for his question that, of course, in accordance with standing orders, had no argument in it whatsoever. Um, in our first year in office, we delivered cheaper childcare, yeah. we delivered cheaper medicines, yeah. we delivered fee-free TAFE, which has just been opposed yet again by the Order. Deputy Leader of Members the Opposition, of and we expanded the single parent payment. Yeah. Those four measures had something in common. They were all opposed by those opposite. On July 1, a tax cut for every taxpayer. Again, those opposite said they were opposed to it before they knew what it was. Then they said they'd roll it back. And then they said we should have an election on it so that they could reverse it. And last week, last week uh, the uh, uh, front benches, including the shadow finance minister, was, was out there again being critical of those tax cuts. Shameful. Critical. They, of course, oppose the energy bill relief for every household and every small business uh, that has been delivered, including the $300 that was delivered uh, most recently to begin on the July 1. Member for Gippsland. Uh, I assume they'll probably oppose the extra two weeks of paid parental leave, um, which would be uh, consistent. The we know Casey. that they're horrified by the idea of a freeze on the cost of PBS medicines. They said that 60-day dispensing would lead to would lead to the end of the pharmaceutical industry. No chemists would be there. Order. I don't know where that where they'd go for the their medicines. Leader of the Nationals. There's a rush, just, just like Wyala was going to disappear, Member for Wells. as the Treasurer says. And we know as well that they've opposed all of the wage increases for those people on the minimum wage. We know that the first increase, that $1 coin that was raised during the election campaign, that they said it was loose. They said it would have devastating consequences. And of course, we know today that over the last Order. year, uh, wages have increased uh, more than inflation, meaning that that is a good thing. That is a good thing uh, for working people. And we know as well that they oppose the 15 per cent pay rise for our childcare workers, for our early educators, who have delivered, who are delivering uh, so much as well. So every time. We have a cost of living measure. There are two things that are certain. One is we'll, we will the Prime uh, work hard to make a difference. Secondly, they'll concluded. oppose it. Yeah. Call to the honourable member for Aston. My question is to the Treasurer. Why is decent pay such an important part of the Albanese Labor government's efforts to help ease cost of living pressures? And how does this approach differ to what has failed in the past? 
call to the Treasurer. Speaker, on behalf of the member for Aston, the Prime Minister and everyone on this side of the House, we say to the early childhood educators who are with us today that we're proud to be delivering the pay rise that you need and deserve to do your really important work. Mr Order. Speaker, our economic plan, our budgets and our government, they're all about helping Australians earn more and keep Order more of the what they earn to help with the cost of living. That's why we're focused on fighting inflation and tax cuts for every taxpayer and decent pay for Australian workers. And in that light, Mr Speaker, today's new wages numbers are very encouraging. They show wages grew 0.8 per cent in the June quarter and 4.1 per cent in annual terms. This is the first time in 15 years that wages growth has gone four for four, four consecutive quarters of annual nominal wage growth of at least 4 per cent. Mr. Speaker. Nominal wages did not grow above 4 per cent for a single quarter for almost a decade under those opposite. Not once, Mr. Speaker. Since our election, average annualised wage growth is almost double the rate we saw under our predecessors. Now, Mr Speaker, they are, they're interjecting about real wages. When we came to office, real wages were falling by 3.4 per cent. In today's numbers, real wages grew again in annual terms for the third consecutive quarter. Mr. Speaker. That's because decent pay is absolutely central to our cost of living agenda. Minimum wages up $143 a week on our watch. A wage rise for aged care workers and early childhood educators. Four quarters of wages growth with a four in front of it. Annual real wages growth for the third quarter in a row. So, Mr Speaker, on our watch, almost a million new jobs, a tax cut for every taxpayer, two surpluses, inflation's halved and wages growth has almost doubled. And they don't like to hear it, Mr Speaker. They hate wages growth. That's why wages were stagnant and workers didn't get a look in for a decade. That's why real wages were falling. They hate wages growth, just like they hated it when rates didn't go up. They hated it when underlying inflation went down. They hated it when we gave a tax cut to every Australian taxpayer. If they had their way, Mr Speaker, wages would be lower. Inflation would be higher. There wouldn't be tax cuts for every taxpayer, and there'd be less help for people Order. who are doing Members it tough. On my left. And in this regard, Mr. Speaker, they are hopelessly divided on every issue except this one. They want people working longer for less, Mr. Speaker. Under this Prime Minister and his government, Australians are earning more and keeping more of what they earn, and that's what we see in today's new wages numbers, and that's why they are so encouraging and so welcome. Yeah. The call to the member for Gray, member for Hume, has the call. My question is to the Prime Minister. After three failed budgets, Labor has added over $315 billion of spending. That's over $30,000 per household. Last oh, week, no, the order, RBA order, order, the member will pause. I don't know how many times I've got to say this. Questions are going to be heard in silence. The Minister for Housing was at the top of her lungs. She's warned. People are not to interject during questions. Member for Hume will begin his question again. Three failed budgets, Labor has added $315 billion of spending over $30,000 per household. Last week, the RBA Governor linked demand to inflation and said we've revised up our forecast for demand growth and that's due to stronger forecast public spending. This Prime Minister promised to reduce the cost of living but the RBA says his decisions are pushing up the cost of living. Why does this tricky Prime Minister repeatedly promise one thing and then do another? I'm not happy with the last part of the question, that descriptor. Prompt. Order. The Prime Minister will answer Go on. the question. Go on. I, thank, I really do thank the member for Hume for his question, Mr Speaker, because what he's done is expose the coalition plan for $315 billion of cuts. He stood up, he stood up here at the dispatch box and he spoke about $315 billion of spending. The shadow finance minister said on the 1st of August, I can tell you exactly what we wouldn't have done, that additional $315 billion of spending. That's what they say, confirmed by the shadow treasurer, backed up by this leader of the opposition. 
Well, let's have a look at what that is. Indexation of the age pension. Apparently they're against that. Indexation of income support payments. They're against that. They're against that. We know they're against the 15 per cent pay rise for early educators. Order. We know they're against the increased wages for aged care workers. We the now know for, that they are against the for funding for rejected. new medicines on the PBS. Every one of them. Those life-saving drugs are all wasteful that will help people in need of cancer and with diseases that need these drugs and need them listed so that they can be affordable. Order. Well, under them, under them, prices way up, way up. We know they're against cheaper childcare. Well, we know that. We know that the uh, deputy leader just before question time confirmed that they're against fee-free take for the 500,000 Australians order. who have received it. The well, you um, asked the order. question. The, the, the deputy leader of the opposition will cease objecting, so I can hear the member for Hume on a point of order. Relevance, Mr. Speaker. The question was. The question was about his policies and how yeah. they are failing Order, Australia. Your seat. Yeah. I want to hear from the Leader of the House. Um, Mr Speaker, as you previously ruled, a point of order can't just be another attempt to get up a media grab when someone's clearly being relevant and the point of relevance is stated. In the the point, it's a clear, it's a clear abuse, subjecting. like the abuse that's continuing now. Look. The question was about a specific fi figure, the $315 billion figure that was being mentioned. So if you bring a figure into it, obviously the Prime Minister may contest or argue that figure and what that means. And I just want to refer, because this has been continuing, practice is clear on page 554, and I ask all members to re review this. It's not in order for ministers to be questioned on opposition policies, but it's equally reasonable for ministers to discuss alternative approaches as part of a free-flowing debate. And that is in practice. Order. Speaker Smith in 2015 adopted the same process as Speaker Andrew did in 2000 and had allowed debate on alternative approaches. He may not like the answer, but that is what practice and that is moving forward. As long as the discussion is about alternative policies is within the context of the government's own policies, I'll be adopting the same practice during the debate. The Prime Minister has the call. Mr Speaker, this is precisely the figure that he used in the question, Mr Speaker. Precisely the question. The question. They're against the more money for infrastructure. They're against funding to secure the future, Order. the future of National Archives and National Library. They'll all be there cheering the Olympians, but apparently they're against funding the Brisbane Olympics 2032 as well, Mr Speaker, because they had nothing. They had nothing in the budget to fund it. Nothing. They're against biosecurity threats Order. that we, we, we introduced as well. They're against funding for PPE, vaccines and hospitals. For health. They're against the funding that we have passed on the GST revenue to the states to pay for hospitals, for schools, for police, for essential services. That is what this question exposes what they are against. This nonsense campaign from those opposite who Order. produced nine budget deficits against one. this government that has Ask produced two one. budget surpluses. Ask it again. Time has concluded. Order. The treasurer, the treasurer will cease interjecting. The member for Hume will cease interjecting. When the House comes to order. We'll hear from the member for Chisholm. Thanks so much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Education. What has been the response to the Albanese Labor government's decision to lift the wages of early childhood education and care workers? Good yeah. call to the Minister for Education. Thanks, Mr Speaker, and can I thank the fantastic member for Chisholm for her question. As the Treasurer pointed out, up there in the public gallery today are some of our fantastic early educators, yeah. people who have worked in this sector for 10, 15, even 20 years. 
and they've been waiting a long time for this, waiting for a government that properly values the work that they do in caring for and educating our youngest Australians, caring for them while their parents go back to work and educating them, preparing them for school. And they, they deserve more than our thanks. They deserve a pay rise. And that's what we're doing, a 15 per cent pay rise for the more than 200,000 early educators, including the workers that are in the gallery today. The fact is, more often than not, they're women. 95 per cent of our early educators are women. In addition to the 15 per cent pay rise, we're also putting in place a fee cap to keep prices down for the more than one million parents who rely on the work of these essential workers. Mr Speaker, when I first got this job, I spoke to my cousin Karen, who's an early educator. She's been, she's been an early educator for more than 30 years. And she gave me three tips. Number one, don't say kids. Kids are goats. <laughs> Call them children. Number two, it's not babysitting. It's early education. And number three, the first five years of a child's life are everything. Everything they see, everything they hear, everything they eat, every smile, every book they read, every lesson that they get shapes and changes and makes the person that they become. And on this side of the parliament, we get it. Up there in the crossbench, they get it. But over there in the Liberal Party, they still don't get it. If you need evidence of that, look at the rambling remarks of Senator Jared Rennick. If you need reminding, remember what he said on the weekend? He said that childcare, that the work of early educators, quote unquote, destroys the family unit. Understand what that means, Mr Speaker. That's not just a criticism of the work of the early educators in the gallery. That's effectively shaming every single mum in this country for wanting to go back to work when they have kids. At the last election, less than one in three women voted for the Liberal Party. And now you've got Liberal senators effectively shaming Australian women, saying that early education destroys the family unit. This isn't just bonkers, this is flat out wrong. And he's doubled down again today and is tweeting the same rubbish again today. Another day, and the opposition leader still can't muster a smile, still can't muster the courage Order. to the call out these loons in his party room. Concluded. Before I call the member for Griffith, I have a number of acknowledgements I'd like to do. It starts everyone to bear with me. I inform the House that present in the gallery today are representatives from Red Cross here today to mark 110 years of service of the Australian Red Cross, led by President Charles Burkett and the new CEO, Andrew Colvin. I'm honoured to inform the House that present in the gallery today are delegates from the Australian Political Exchange Council's 19th delegation from Japan, led by Mr Huizaki Fuji. And I'm honoured to inform the House that present in the gallery today is a member of the Indonesian House of Representatives, Ms Sarasa Wahati Johona Johnhati Ko Suma, along with the Indonesian parliamentary delegation led by Mr Ravinda Ulanga. And also in the gallery is a delegation from Fiji, participating in the Integrity and Excellence in Public Governance Masterclass 2024, led by the Honourable Rachel Noll and Professor Ken Smith AO. And also in the gallery is members of the Beyond Broncos Emerging Leaders Program. On behalf of the House, welcome to you all. Give a call to the member for Griffith. To the Housing Minister. Yesterday, the Minister apologised for referencing Treasury modelling on build to rent that did not exist, then seemed to claim the 160,000 figure came from Property Council modelling of Labor's scheme, which is also not true. In fact, the Property Council says Labor's plan won't build any extra housing. Experts say build to rent overseas sees big corporate landlords use rent maximisation strategies by algorithmically coordinating rent hikes and keeping properties vacant to drive up rents. Why does Labor want to give money to developers to hurt renters and drive up rents. Order. Order. When the House comes to order. We'll hear from the Minister for Housing and the Minister for Homelessness. Thank you, Speaker. And I have to say I'm not surprised by the nature of that question. I mean, doesn't, say, doesn't it say it all? Questions like this are not going to help us build a single new home for a single person in our country. And I want the Parliament, I want the parliament to really hear this. Labor has a $32 billion Homes for Australians plan that we are implementing. 
And when we think about what we are doing in this policy space, we're thinking about these childcare workers who are sitting up in the gallery here. Those are the people that have every entitlement to deserve the support of government to own their own home. We are thinking about Order, homes for Australians, Biden. not silly debates in Parliament House like other parties in this Parliament. Now, Speaker, let me say a little bit about this Build to Rent scheme, which is in the Senate at the moment. A really core and integral part of Labor's commitment with the states and territories around this country to build 1.2 million homes desperately needed by Australians. Speaker, I spoke to the Parliament yesterday about some of the terrible implications for the housing shortage that we have in this country. Speaker, we have got millions of Australians who've, whose lives are fundamentally affected by the fact that they cannot get the housing they need. The answer to this problem, to the rental distress, to the housing unaffordability, to the rise in homelessness that we are seeing, is that we need to build more homes. And that's why our government has supported this ambitious target to build more homes for Australians. Now, Speaker, when we look at our rental market in Australia, there's a really unique difference between the way we're doing things here and what we see overseas. One of those differences is that we do not see this particular type of rental, build to rent, as it's known in the sector. Now, we want to assist Australians to have lots of different rental options. Um, what the research shows, what the experts shows, is that the scheme in the Senate will build more homes. There is dispute about how many homes, but it will be tens of thousands of additional homes. Now, what I would say to the parliament is that if we want to stop success and progress on this matter, then we should play politics business as usual. We should continue to have the Greens building this unholy alliance with the Liberals who dropped the ball on this for an entire decade. We'll continue to see them come into the Order. Senate, say that they care, but block progress and play politics instead. And I can tell you that through all of this debate, through all of this debate, our government will have a single focus. More homes, more affordable housing for more Australians, and that's our commitment to our citizens. Yeah. Give the call to the member for Bendigo. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Early Childhood Education. How is the Albanese Labor government recognising the skilled and professional work early childhood education and care workers do to help our youngest Australians to grow and thrive? What approaches to early childhood education has the government rejected? I call to the Minister for Early Childhood Education and the Minister for Youth. Thank you, Speaker, and I do thank the amazing member for Bendigo, not just for her question, but for her continued advocacy and her tireless support for the early childhood education and care sector. Mr Speaker, early childhood educators and workers deserve a wage that reflects their professionalism, that reflects their qualifications, the quality of education and care that they provide, and that recognises the valuable contributions they make to our economy and, importantly, to the well-being of Australia's children. And today, as the Prime Minister and the Minister have pointed out, we're joined in the, in the gallery by some early childhood educators. And on Thursday, when the Prime Minister announced a 15 per cent increase in the wages for early childhood workers, there were tears of joy and tears of relief. And that's because early childhood workers have, for too long, asked something very simple. They've asked to be valued. They've asked to be recognised by the government, just as they are by the parents who entrust them with the care and education for their children. Not a big ask. Not a big ask at all. And Paige, a passionate educator, hit the nail on the head when she said this. She said, it's so great to have a female-led industry actually being recognised as having real qualifications and actually being more than just babysitters. We are educators who help develop children, and the first five years are so crucial for them, so it's actually nice to be recognised for what we are trying to do. That's the words, they're the words of Paige. Mr Speaker, this is good policy. It's good for the 200,000 workers who will get a pay rise of at least $100 a week before the end of the year. It's good for the 1.2 million parents and families who will be assured that fee increases are capped. It's good for the economy and it's good for children. It really is a no-brainer. Really is a no-brainer. But Mr Speaker, I'm asked about Order. other approaches. And the only other approach is that coming from the opposition, who have refused to back this in. 
who have refused to denounce the comments made by the captain's pick senator, and who in their immediate release alluded to this as somehow undermining the Australian way of life. Well, I would like to see those opposite turn around and look the workers in the eyes and explain to them why they think they don't deserve a pay rise and what they mean when they reference an Australian way of life. The opposition wants to make this all about ideology so that they can continue to denigrate and ignore the important contribution of our early childhood educators and teachers and the importance that they make to child wellbeing. And I'll finish in the words of Lisa, who said, I can stay in the job I love, and that is going to change a lot of lives, concluded. not just my own. Uh, thanks, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Housing. Yesterday, the minister was forced to apologise after claiming Treasury had modelled your government's failed build-to-rent policy. During question time yesterday, the minister claimed some experts Order. believe CFMU corruption and illegality has, and I quote, no impact on residential construction. Can the minister name those experts? Order. Members on my right cease interjecting. The member for Wills will leave the chamber under 94A. Immediately. <coughs> no interjections whilst questions are being asked. The Minister for Housing and Homelessness has the call. Well, thank you, Speaker. And that question just following up on the shameless politicking of the Green. And we have again a Liberal come forward and ask a question not about how we're going to build more homes for Australians, but about how we can play more politics in this parliament. And I can tell you really clearly, Speaker, Order. that my focus on this role in this role is not about what happens here in Parliament House. The minister is 30 seconds mm. into her answer, so she's just going to pause. I'm not sure what the remainder of her answer is going to be in terms of direct relevance, so she'll just pause for a moment. I'll hear from the member for Deakin on a point of order. Uh, thanks, pause. Mr Speaker. And, uh, the minister has had 30 seconds. The question, again, was very tight. I asked the minister no, to name the expert. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. The question. Oh. The Leader of the House on a point of order. Just to the point of order, the Shadow Minister seems to have forgotten all the quotes and all the comments in the preamble, all of which open up the relevance rule. All of it. And there was a series of comments leading up to the section at the end. Yep. And he can't take a point of order on relevance thinking that only the last few words will yep. constitute the relevance the, rule. Yep, no, resume your seat. We'll, we'll, handle, we'll handle this. Unlike yesterday, when I ruled that it was a tight question, the minister had to be directly relevant. When you add commentary, uh, reports uh, regarding things that happened in the past, obviously the minister is able to be directly relevant to those parts of the question. Yes, there was a part of the question, um, but when you add in other things, unlike yesterday, this is a broader question. So the, I'm responding you, don't to need to, you don't need to respond. No, no. Yeah, resume no, your seat. Resume your, resume your seat. Unless it's a different point of order, unless it's a different point of order, I've explained to the member the difference between yesterday's question to this question, the elements of it, but I'll hear from him on a point of order. I do no, I do appreciate that, Mr. Speaker. This question is similarly tight to yesterday's no, question. No, resume, resume your seat. Resume your seat. Resume your seat. So the point of order of relevance has been taken. We've ruled on that. We've made the decision. So for the remainder, one, uh, two minutes thirty, the minister will be directly relevant. And she has the call. Absolutely. Now, Speaker, I'd say again, if we continue to see we'll this approach accepting. from those opposite, from those on the crossbench, we're never going to get the kind of traction that we need to order fix this problem for, for Australians. 
We will see a change to the housing situation in our country where we see people come together in the centre, the states and the Commonwealth working together, the different political parties around this country setting aside Order. politics for once and actually working together on this problem. Now, I have hope for the crossbench. Those opposite, I don't hold out a lot of hope because the truth is that we had a decade of government in this country where those opposites sat on these benches and did nothing about the housing problem in this nation. In fact, I'll just share two facts with you, Speaker. One of them is that in the last Member five Connor. years that the coalition were in power, the housing ministers around this country didn't meet a single time. Five years. They didn't meet a single time. The and I'll order, tell you one more, Speaker. No, the member for Deakin is warned. He has asked the question. He's going to remain silent. And if he interjects one more time, he won't be here for the remainder of the answer or question time. Thank you, Speaker. And I'll tell you one more. You've seen, led by our Prime Minister, for whom secure housing was an indelible part of his journey to the Prime Ministership of this country, we have brought the Commonwealth back into the housing discussion. Now, Speaker, Order. we spent and invested more on housing in just our last budget than the entire nine years of the Coalition were in power, Speaker. They have no credibility in this debate, and this question does not lend them a single shred further. The call to the <coughs> the House comes to order. We'll hear from the honourable member for Lingiari. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, how is the the Albanese Labor government supporting our vital early childhood education and care workers with a pay rise, and what has been the response? The call to the Prime Minister. I thank the member for Lingari for her question, and I also join in welcoming uh, the early educators who are here uh, in the Parliament House today uh, for question time. Uh, we last week announced the increasing of workers' wages who work in the early education sector by 15 per cent. 10 per cent in December, $103, and then a further 5 per cent in uh, December of next year, adding up to $155 a week. Two parts of the deal, increased wages as well as keeping fees down for families. This is policy that's good for workers, good for children, good for families, but importantly as well, good for our economy. Because we know that accessible, affordable childcare is key economic reform. It is low hanging fruit if we can increase workforce participation and boost productivity. It means uh, women being able to return to the workforce earlier or work additional time, helping family budgets, making an enormous difference to our economy. It follows in the great tradition of other Labor reforms as we move towards universal provision, uh, Medicare, superannuation, the NDIS, these great economic reforms that are good for our economy, but they're also good for our society. And I must uh, how this has been received, because we know that those opposite take a different view. And uh, the minister uh, today was talking about the comments of Senator Rennick yesterday, who said that it would destroy the family unit, it would brainwash children early with the woke mind virus. Uh, and we know that this is a fellow who's been uh, supported, personally endorsed, by the leader of the opposition. Uh, but uh, to my surprise, Mr Speaker, the Senator has doubled down. He wrote to me yesterday, Mr Speaker. He wrote to me yesterday, and it explains perhaps why he's not only against childcare provision. This is what he had to say about cost of living on behalf of the coalition. The best way to deal with the cost of living is to repeal the financial deregulation that occurred under the Hawke Keating government. So now we have the policies Order. of nuclear energy in the 2040s, divestment of uh, supermarkets, we have, we have financial deregulation all go 
We'll just re-regulate the whole economy and that'll fix it. Don't worry about paying people properly. Don't worry about economic reform or workforce participation. Mr Speaker, how out of touch are they? The call to the honourable member for Deakin. Thanks, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Housing. Now, the Minister yesterday in question time claimed some experts believe CFMEU corruption in illegality has, and I quote, no impact on residential construction in the, expert, in the view of some experts. Can the minister name those experts? Call to the minister. Order. Give a call to the minister for housing and minister for homelessness. Thank you so much, Speaker. And I, I would just say to the member opposite, I'm not sure the point he is trying to make here. If he believes that the CFMEU are driving up residential Order. construction costs, Speaker, Order. I'll allow you to call the house to order. The, the member for Morton and the leader of the opposition will cease interjecting. The, the member was heard in silence, and the minister is going to be given the same courtesy. She has the call. Speaker, if the member opposite believes that the CFMEU is driving up residential construction uh, prices, then why are the Liberals not helping us clean up this un union right. in the Senate? Right. Now, Speaker. Whatever your view about Order. this, the policy fix is the same. We have a union that's a problem, and our government is taking steps to fix it, and the Liberals are trying to stop us from doing it. The Minister will pause the member for Deakin on a point of order. Uh, thanks, Mr Speaker. Point of order is on relevance. This was, uh, under your instructions, a very tight question. There was nothing expansive about the question. It referred to the Minister's statements and asked her to name those experts. Now, if the minister cannot name those experts because she made that up at the resume dispatch box, your, she should your seat. No. The member for Deakin is entitled to take a point of order. He is not entitled to then to add extra commentary to the point of order. That is an abuse of the standing orders. He is on a warning. He will now leave the chamber under 94A. Yeah. Member for the Chief Government Whip. My question. Oh, no, 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 no. Just the Chief Government can resume his seat. Has the Minister concluded her answer? Minister in continuation then. Order. Thank you so much, Speaker. And isn't the air just feeling a little bit fresher in here now without the member for Deakin in the chamber? Uh, not for the first time, Speaker. The member for Deakin is making absolutely no sense. If he is concerned about the impact this union is having on residential construction prices, then he can go into his caucus room and talk to his senator colleagues about helping our government clean up this union. Speaker, whether Order. What's up with these guys today, Speaker? Order. <laughs> the, 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 just a minute. Order. The minister. No. No. The minister will. The minister will cease her remarks while the leader is on his feet. Order. Speaker. The leader of the opposition has the call. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It's obviously a serious topic. I ask her whether your ruling is that this minister is in order. Uh, we've been going down this path for a, a while. If I make a ruling at the time, as I did, um, there's no opportunity to come back and ask the second chance what the ruling is. So no other leader of the opposition has done that before. So I've, we've moved on. I'm just going to ask the minister to conclude her answer. On the point of order. Application, thank you. I'm asking for your ruling, Mr Speaker. If it wasn't clear before, I thought it was. But to make it clear for the House, mm. is it your ruling that the Minister is relevant to the you, question that was you, asked you, of her? Yep. The Leader of the House. That's a second point of order on relevance, which is clearly outside of standing orders. Yep. Just, just so I'm clear to the Leader of the House, you don't have standing to raise another point of order on clarification of a ruling. It's never happened before in practice. I understand what you're trying to do. You're trying to get me to go back in time to say, what was your ruling, clarified it. Sure. We've already made, but we'd already made it. So when I dealt with the member for Deakin, if you were not happy with the way I handled that, 
you wanted to move something on that, you could have done that. It doesn't enable you to do that in the future. We've done this a couple of times, so just for the clarity of the House, when a ruling is made, that is the time to take action, not to then wait a couple of minutes or 30 seconds later to go, I seek your ruling, what was your ruling? Okay? The Minister will conclude her answer. Thank you, Speaker, and I regard these continuous points of order as a real mark of success. A great compliment from those opposite. Thank you so the, much, no, fellas. Thank you so the much. The just um, going to speaker, conclude her answer. Just without in concluding, I would say, Speaker, that it's very clear what's going on here. Uh, the, the coalition are in the parliament again, and they are playing politics within an inch of its life. If they cared about costs in residential construction, as they claim to do, they should tell their Senate colleagues to go into the Senate and help our government clean up this sector. Order. The House comes to order. We'll hear from the Chief Government Whip. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations. What action is the Albanese Labor Government taking to clean up the CFMEU? Give a call to the Leader of the House. I thank the Chief Government Whip for the question. The number one job of any union is to protect its members and to look out for their interests. The reported behaviour from the construction division of the CFMEU is the opposite of this. And the government has zero tolerance, zero tolerance for violence Order. or the thuggery or intimidation. Order. Order. No. Members on my left the, will best cease way, the best way to deal with this is by putting the union into administration. We made clear, we made clear that we would support an application from the regulator, the general manager of the Fair Work Commission, and we would intervene in support of an application for the union to be put into administration. We also made clear that if the union in any way resisted that application, we were willing to legislate. It's clear that the union has not agreed with what was put forward in the federal court, and therefore we are legislating. There are effectively two groups that have been seeking to delay administration. We always presumed there would be the lawyers from the CFMEU. We hadn't suspected there would be the senators of the Liberal and National parties. <laughs> but we have a situation now where the unity ticket on delaying, order. on delaying the union being put into administration— The member for Fisher. What some of the leadership of that construction division could have only dreamed of is being considered to be delivered for them by the Leader of the Opposition and his senators. The impact of administration is that the government's bill will ensure a clear pathway for an administrator to take charge of all branches of the construction division of the CFMEU Order. for up to three years to review individual union officials and determine whether or not they should retain their position, the to examine how Fisher money is, is being warned. spent and whether money being spent is in the best interests of members. Legislation puts obligations on officers, on employees and professional advisers to cooperate with the administrator to access all assets, all property and documents for the purposes of the administration. If you had deregistration, though, if you had deregistration, the entire leadership would remain in place. Because of laws that were changed under work choices, their capacity to appear before the commission would, re would remain Order, constant. Would remain constant. There is an opportunity now where, if we want to clean up this organisation, the legislation the is before the business. parliament and it should be passed. The call to the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. My question is to the Prime Minister. On Insiders recently, when asked about establishing a Makarata Commission with responsibility for truth-telling, the Prime Minister said, well, that's not what we've proposed. But on election night 2022, the Prime Minister promised to implement the Uluru Statement in full, the Voice, Truth-Telling and Treaty, and repeated that promise on more than 34 occasions. Why does this tricky Prime Minister repeatedly promise one thing and do another? The Prime Minister has the call. I thank uh, the Deputy Leader for uh, her question. The theme of this year's festival at Gama 
which uh, was uh, broadcast, even if you weren't there and didn't make the effort, anyone in the coalition to actually sit down and engage, was fire, strength and renewal. Uh, strength and commitment uh, from First Nations people uh, to deal with the, the trauma that many of them feel from the defeat of the referendum, which is uh, very real, regardless of uh, where you stood on that issue. I would have thought that it was appropriate to have uh, some respect uh, for uh, the, uh, the family of uh, uh, Unipingu, it was Jawa, who has taken over the leadership of the Yulmu people, uh, the brother of uh, Unipingu, uh, who was farewelled uh, just uh, a year ago. A great Indigenous leader and someone someone who was responsible probably more than anyone else for the Uluru Statement from the heart. Uh, there, what we did uh, was to acknowledge, as, uh, as the incoming minister has done, uh, the need to reach out. It's going to be difficult to take a point of order on relevance here. And the Prime Minister is framing his answer, obviously, around where he made the statements. Anyway, the deputy leader on a point of order. It, 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 Mr Speaker, it is a question on relevance because the question was about the Prime Minister's statements about Makarata and he hasn't mentioned this at all. Well, I, I'm not sure where, I won't be accurate about where the statements were made, but I'm assuming the Prime Minister talking about where he made the statements, which was at the festival on the interview, but he can explain that to the House. So, just make sure that his comments when he's talking about his position about the policy topic is being directly relevant. So we'll make sure he continues on that standing order. To the, the statement I was asked about, a statement that I made at the Gama Festival, and I'm talking about the Gama Festival, and uh, that was where I made it. And at that festival, uh, we talked as well with First Nations people about a new pathway towards how we close the gap. The new pathway was all about economic <coughs> empowerment, uh, trying to search for a way to achieve uh, what I would hope everyone in this chamber wants to see achieved, a closing of the gap in education, a closing of the gap when it comes to health, a closing of the gap when it comes to life expectancy, when it comes to Order. all of the Deputy Leader of the Opposition has asked a question which is going to have silence for the remainder of the answer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Now, I, I, I don't quite understand how any of these comments can draw uh, partisan interjections. Because one of the things that Senator McCarthy has said, has said uh, yesterday in the parliament, we learned from the referendum and the pain and hardship that created to First Nations people in this country was the fact there was no bipartisan support. Uh, she went on to say that we want to walk down the pathway of trying to get maximum support for an objective that, that we as a, a nation, like the referendum was held, the yelling has to stop and we need to work on ways in which we can achieve better outcomes. Yeah. And that is the focus yeah. of my government. Concluded. The call to the honourable member for Swan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Resources and Northern Australia. How is the Albanese Labor government delivering a future made in Australia by supporting our critical minerals industry? And what is standing in our way? Call to the Minister for Resources and the Minister for Northern Australia. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the very hardworking member for Swan for that question. A future made in Australia will be built on the most significant budget for the resources sector in a generation, including a 10% production tax incentive credit for critical minerals valued at over $17 billion. This production tax incentive will drive investment in processing 
critical minerals onshore here in Australia and ensure that Australia gets a greater share of the benefit of adding value to our vast mineral resources. Yeah. It will help create well-paid jobs, opening up training pathways and protect our sovereign capability. Yeah. We will make more here in Australia and help the world to decarbonise. And I'm asked, Mr Speaker, what is standing in the way? Well, you don't have to look too far. It is, of course, the Liberals and the Nationals opposite. It took mere minutes for the Coalition to reject this industry-supported incentive on budget night earlier this year, uh, but apparently, of course, the opposition leader is now changing his tune and, according to some reports in the media, a new package is shortly on its way. Ah, but we know Western Australians and indeed all Australians can't really believe a word that is said from those opposite. And as we know, the Leader of the Opposition says one thing on the West Coast and a completely other thing here in Canberra on the East Coast. In the absence of any coherent policy or any way to explain their failure to support the critical minerals op uh, industry, the Opposition Leader simply says, as the Minister for Science and Industry observed yesterday, we'll have more to say. Well, that may be a pithy catchphrase. It would be far more useful for the critical mineral sector if the Leader of the Opposition simply said yes to production tax credits. But, of course, the Leader of the Opposition can't say yes, because while he's in Perth trying to fool Western Australians, the Shadow Treasurer is here on the East Coast opposing production tax incentives and calling it welfare for billionaires. Well, this is a class warfare I did not expect coming from the opposition. The coalition are also at odds with their state colleagues in Western Australia. Libby Medham, the leader of the Liberals, and Shane Love, the leader of the opposition and leader of the Nationals, have joined our Labor Premier Roger Cook in backing the production tax incentives. And the coalition is surprisingly also at odds with industry, despite claiming to be their great protector. And of course, they weren't so enthusiastic about the resources sector. They had two ministers for resources. But uh, now it's an even bigger mess. Uh, now they're in opposition than when they were in government. Of course, we can't forget the time they tumbled the resources portfolio right out of cabinet, so the Nationals could have their little argument about who was going to be their Order. leader. So instead of supporting PTCs, they say all sorts of things the about the policies of the government. What they need to say is yes to reduction tax credits because it's what the industry has called for and it's what this government will deliver a future made right here in Order. Australia. Yeah. time has concluded. Give the call to the honourable member for Mackellar. My question is to the Minister for Health. Australia has been a world leader in protecting our young people from smoking and vaping. There is irrefutable evidence that gambling is also a serious public health threat, especially for our young people through suicide, addiction and family breakdown. The public health community is united in their call for a complete ban on gambling advertising. As the Health Minister, will you heed the public health community's call and support a full ban on gambling advertising to protect our children from being preyed upon for profit? Call to the Minister for Health and Aged Care. Uh, thank you, uh, Speaker, and I thank the member for her question and her uh, deep engagement on, on health policy since, um, since being elected to this parliament after a very long career in, in health herself as a GP. Uh, as I think the member knows and other members in this parliament know, uh, the issues that she has raised in her question are uh, being led in terms of a government response by the Minister for Communications and the Minister for Social Services. But, but I am uh, happy to give um, a perspective from, uh, from, um, from our position uh, in, in health. Uh, gambling services is one of those goods and services available in the community that, that consumed and enjoyed responsibly and in moderation uh, can lead to no harm to the individual themselves or to those around them, including their families and the broader community, but used to excess, uh, used in a problematic way, can cause real harm uh, both to the individual and to uh, the broader community. Uh, problem gambling in particular, as the member points out, uh, can cause very serious harm to an individual and to those around them, uh, and that harm can extend particularly to mental health impacts. Um, mental health impacts like anxiety and depression, uh, but pathological gambling, as the member I suspect knows, is now a recognisable mental illness in the latest version of DSM, DSM-5, the International Psychological Diagnostic. Manual. And that's why, of course, 
This government, as the Prime Minister pointed out yesterday, has taken more action than any other government before yeah, it yeah. around prevention, early intervention and harm reduction when it comes to problem gambling. The Prime Minister outlined just a range of those measures today in response uh, yesterday, sorry, in response to a question by the member for Goldstein. They are very significant, and in two years they are way more than any government, Labor or Liberal, frankly, has ever delivered in this parliament before. I'm not going to go through all of them. They are very significant. I particularly want to refer to BetStop, though, which I think is the most significant harm reduction measure ever initiated in this parliament. But as the Prime Minister also said yesterday, getting to the heart of the, the member's question around advertising, the Prime Minister did say that the status quo regarding the saturation of gambling advertising, particularly where ex the children are exposed to it, is untenable. Uh, and as he also said, the government is working through those issues, and that work is being led very appropriately by the Minister for Communications and the Minister for Social Services. Call to the honourable member for Pearce. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Why are production tax credits a central part of the Albanese Labor government's future Made in Australia plan, and what are the obstacles to their implementation? Thank you. Give a call to the Treasurer. Thanks, Speaker, and thanks to uh, the member for her uh, characteristically perceptive question and for being a great voice out of the West here yeah. in the National yeah. Parliament. Mr Speaker, our focus Always. is on easing the cost of living Member and fixing Batten. the budget and also strengthening our economy. And that's why we're investing $22.7 billion in a future made in Australia to create more jobs and more opportunities right across the country. And this is all about maximising the economic and industrial benefits which will come from the big global shift to net zero emissions. And the biggest part of our plan is tax breaks, and that's deliberate because a future made in Australia is all about attracting private investment, not replacing private investment. Uh, we know that the global energy transformation represents a golden opportunity for Australia, and our production tax credits will help us make the most of that opportunity. They will incentivise investment in renewable hydrogen. They will boost production of refined critical minerals. They will create new jobs and new industries and also leverage uh, our traditional economic strengths. Now, Mr Speaker, everyone on this side of the House wants Australia to grab these opportunities. Yeah. But once again, those opposite have collapsed in a shambolic and humiliating heap, this time on production tax credits. Now, in this instance, Mr Speaker, the Shadow Treasurer has been uncharacteristically clear. For example, on the 14th of May, he said we don't support the $13.7 billion of production tax credits. On the 15th of May, he called it handouts for billionaires. On the 8th of August, he said, we've been very clear we don't support the production credits. I don't know how much clearer you can be, he said. <laughs> he's so certain, Mr Speaker, that he's already counting them as a saving in his budget, which makes him about $300 billion short. Now, Mr Speaker, to be fair, the Leader of the Opposition also called them corporate welfare. But in Kalgoorlie, as the Resources Minister said, he changed his tune. And today we read that the opposition leader has hinted at a rethink. <laughs> Mr Speaker, if you listen closely, you can hear the familiar sound of the Shadow Treasurer getting rolled again. <laughs> Mr Speaker, he has humiliated the Shadow Treasurer and he has torched whatever is left of the Shadow Treasurer's credibility. He's rolled him on stage three tax cuts, migration, super for housing, supermarkets, and now they are deeply divided on production tax credits, Mr Speaker. This side of the House has a plan for a future made in Australia. That side of the House is an embarrassing shambles, divisive and divided. In the third year of a three-year term, and still no coherent view about production tax Order, credits, still no Graham. costed economic policies and still no economic credibility. Yeah. Give the call to the Manager of Opposition Business. My question is to the Prime Minister. Have you ever committed to establishing a Makarata Commission? Order. Give the call to the Prime Minister. I thank the member for Bradfield for his question. Now, the member for Bradfield, when it comes to Indigenous affairs, does have an interest. He's so interested 
He held two forums during the referendum, one for yes and one for no. <laughs> That's how interested and committed he is, Mr Speaker, to advancing the interests of Indigenous Australians. Uh, we, uh, I, I refer to my, my, my previous Order. answer. Uh, I, outlined, I outlined at Gama a plan for economic empowerment. I'm outlining practical plans for housing, $4 billion for remote housing. We have an agreement through the schools agreement what in the Northern to Territory to lift people up on education. The, the, the Prime Minister is going to pause so I can hear from the Leader of the Opposition. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. It uh, obviously is on relevance. It couldn't possibly be tighter. It was direct and it deserves an honest and straightforward answer from the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister which has escaped him so far. Has the Prime Minister concluded his answer? Well, he's 40, se uh, 40 seconds in. Thanks Order. The, the Leader of the Opposition. The, the Leader of the Opposition will cease interjecting. He's taken the point of order. And just order the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. I can remind all members. Reflect. Oh, order. I'm going to just remind the Leader of the Opposition and all members, reflections on a members is highly disorderly. It goes both sides. So standing order 90. Just want to remind people about that standing order. You're entitled to make a point of order, but I just ask members not to reflect on members. Well, the Prime Minister is 40 seconds in. He's going to have to, for the remainder of his answer, be directly relevant. Finished. Prime Minister will, the Prime Minister will continue. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to uh, Makarata, of course, means coming together after struggle. One of the things that we are doing, of course, is consulting post-referendum. As you order, the leader, of, the leader of the opposition, as you expect us to do, from a bloke who was responsible for questions being asked, saying that interest rates would be determined by the Reserve Bank uh, if the referendum was carried last year. speaks about an honesty when it comes to Indigenous to affairs. Mr Speaker, what we will do as consult, that is what we are continuing to do, continuing to do. We're consulting, but we're also putting out there a range of ideas that I would hope could get the support of people in this parliament across the board on economic empowerment, on opportunities for job creation. We have the beginning of the remote jobs plan as well, taking the old CDP and creating real jobs with real wages, with real training for Indigenous people. That is precisely what we want to see to advance the interests of Indigenous Australians. Give a call. Order. When the House comes to order, we'll hear from the member for Hasluck. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. How is the Albanese Labor government's future made in Australia helping to unlock the potential of Australian grain growers and what could be standing in the way? I could call to the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry and the Minister for Small Business. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I do want to thank our terrific member for Hasluck and her support, for her support for the grain growers in Western Australia and her home state and indeed around the country. Because, of course, she understands that the grain Order. and the oil and seed members producers my left. are world-class innovators. And they are indeed innovating. It was terrific to be in an event that they hosted in Parliament House last night together with the Minister the for member Infrastructure. For will cease Mr detecting. Speaker, it's no surprise that uh, the member is excited about our future made in Australia and what it can mean for grain and oil sea producers. Indeed, Labor's Future Made in Australia plan will help maximise the economic benefits of the move to net zero. And one of the priorities of the Future Made in Australia is the development of Australian low-carbon liquid fuel industry. And this is something that's already happening overseas, Mr. Speaker, and it's happening with Australian grain and oil seeds overseas. 60 per cent of canola exported to Europe is used to produce biofuels. 60% of our canola that's exported is used to produce biofuels. And whilst our agricultural trade is critical to the industry, Labor wants these jobs and innovation here in Australia as well, Mr Speaker. We want more opportunities for our producers both here and overseas. That's why our Future Made in Australia plan will see more of the produce staying onshore, being transformed right here 
into sustainable fuels for Australians, Mr. Speaker. Order. We saw in our recent budget $1.7 billion the in the Future the Made in Australia Innovation Fund, and this will support the development and production of low carbon liquid fuel pathways here in Australia. This will help the potential of tens of thousands of grain and oilseed growers around the country, creating more jobs and unlocking the potential of local industries, often in regional communities around the country. Mr. Speaker. And grain Corps, of course, has stated, and I quote, an Australian renewable fuel refining industry will build a valuable new domestic market for our nation's growers and feedstock producers, with the benefits flowing onto regional communities and consumers. Now, that is grain core about the industry's potential with the future made in Australia, Mr. Speaker. And who could argue with that? Well, apparently those opposite are arguing with that, Mr. Speaker. I'm surprised that the Nats over there aren't supporting the farmers and the grain and oil and seed producers who want to turn their product into biofuels in Australia, Order. Mr. Speaker. And I'll say Order. they should be backing Labor's plan, Mr. Speaker, because it is about a sustainable future and making sure our farmers and Order. our producers, the, the people the doing the hard work, day in and day out, that they get the benefits of the future made in Australia as well as local communities right around the country. Yeah. Call to the honourable member for Curtin. This is a question for the Minister for Communications. I understand there are AFL executives in the House today. Is it true that the government continues to water down its proposed gambling reform because of pressure from the powerful broadcast media, sports codes and gambling companies against the wishes of the Australian community? I give the call to the Minister for Communications. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the honourable member for her question. Mr Speaker, the problem is there. The problem about gambling harms, and I'm sure every member of this place is concerned about that. On the important issue of wagering advertising, I've made it clear that the status quo is untenable. The need for meaningful action is clear, and we know that Roy Morgan Insights recently showed, amongst other things, that the number of people betting on sports has doubled in the past five years, and 10 per cent of sports bettors are classified at risk of problem gambling. Now, Mr Speaker, we know that this is unacceptable, and that's why we need reform, and that's why we need to get reform right to deliver both harm reduction and cultural change. Now, commissioned under the Albanese Labor government, we had a comprehensive report by our late colleague Peter Murphy with one of the best analyses of the problem. It is time now to turn to implementation. And there are three priorities at stake here, Mr Speaker. Tackling the normalisation of wagering in sport, reducing the exposure of children to wagering advertising, and tackling the saturation and targeting of advertisements, especially in the online space and especially to vulnerable groups such as young men aged 18 to 45. Now, the member's question goes to stakeholders. The member's question goes to the process that we are undertaking at the moment, addressing these priorities. Having gathered the evidence about harm in response to this report, we have assessed the impact of various options and we're consulting on a proposed model and stakeholders are putting their view, views forward. And the government will continue to consult in a mature and orderly manner consistent with a proper cabinet process. Now, Mr Speaker, the member's question also contains some imputations. And I think it's important to have the facts here. The facts, for example, not assisted by some commentary, and I will quote, in Teal Independent MP Zoe Daniels said Rowland had met 66 times with gambling executives in six months, according to documents uncovered by a Freedom of Information inquiry. And it goes on to be repeated in a quote from the member for Goldstein. She is conspiring with the sector to continue grooming young people. Oh. Mr Speaker, that is not what those FOI documents uncovered. In fact, the documents will show I met zero times, yeah. zero times with yeah. gambling executives. 
And we will continue to go about this process with the facts in an orderly way. Order. Because facts are important here, Mr Speaker. Has concluded. Order. The call to the honourable member for Newcastle. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Local Government. What action is the Albanese Labor government taking to support regional Australia, including through the creation of a homegrown, low-carbon liquid fuel industry? And what kind of support is this future Made in Australia receiving, particularly in the regions? Call to the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Local Government. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And can I thank the member for Newcastle for her question? And of course, she's a strong advocate not just for the people of Newcastle but for the regions overall. We do understand that there are people under pressure and people who are doing it tough in our communities. And as a government, our number one priority is delivering cost of living relief through tax cuts, energy relief, and through pay rises. Our policies are helping Australians earn more and keep more of what they earn. But at the same time, we are also working on new jobs for the future. That is what our Future Made in Australia policy is all about, a key pillar of which is creating a domestic low-carbon liquid fuel industry here in this country. It will help hard to abate sectors, uh, transport sectors to reduce their emissions while importantly creating new jobs and opportunities all the way across regional Australia. From growers to refineries, this policy is good for regional Australia, creating new income streams for farmers and new opportunities for workers. Right now, much of our farmers' feedstock, including 60 per cent of Australian canola, is exported to Europe to produce biofuels. Supporting a low-carbon liquid fuel industry is a policy we know that is something the national parties have been calling for for quite some time. We know the National Farmers' Federation said in their submission on the Future Made in Australia that the NFS has long supported the development of the Australian bioenergy and low-carbon liquid fuel industries, with Australian agriculture playing an important role in the supply chain. We know that regional communities are set to benefit from this policy. It's supported by GrainCorp, by Bioenergy Australia and the petroleum industry, like BP, who are working to establish a renewable fuel site in Quinana in Western Australia, a state that is set to benefit significantly from a future made in Australia not only on low-carbon liquid fuels but also on critical minerals. We know that there is already work undertaken by Ampol, uh, GrainCorp and IFM to explore establishing Australia's own integrated renewable fuels industry in Brisbane, a really important initiative. But what we know from the nods from the National Party that they support it, that they get it, but we also know that we've got a shadow treasurer who says that this is billions for billionaires, failing to understand the importance of working with the private sector, working with the private Order. sector to actually create Order. more Members jobs, particularly over in the West. And now we've got the Leader of the Opposition crab walking over away when he's over in the West. You can't say one thing over in the West and another thing here in Canberra. They don't care about what happens in Western Australia. They don't care about West Australians' jobs. On this side, we are supporting local jobs, supporting the regions. On this, that side of the chamber, they are saying our efforts are a wasted effort. To the Prime Minister. I ask for further questions to be placed on the notice paper. So the